Well, hello there. Welcome to the Noise Blast Hour, sponsored by Noise Engineering. I'm your host, Chris Kaiser. This sporadic release, which is number 12 of the Noise Blast Hour, features Voca Gentle, a band out of Bristol, England. We met Voca Gentle when William J. Stokes, one of the band members, randomly emailed about one of his modules. We got to chatting and we discovered that we really liked their music. And one thing led to another, and here we are with a wonderful Noise Blast Hour. Their first album, Start Claiming the Symbols, is available now on, well, all of the places. And they have a second album coming out on October 22nd, so this is fortuitous timing. Um, one, of the al- one of the singles from that album came out just this past Thursday called TV Bra. And a couple of the other uh, singles are already available wherever you listen. So take a listen to all of these songs um, wherever you want. Enjoy the couple of songs that they've recorded for us today. Also will be on the forthcoming album. As usual, stick around after the set for an interview with William J. Stokes from the band, and uh, enjoy.
This is me on the Sabbath. The smell of meth I open. That's normal life, man. I know you just want an easy life.
comfortable Respect my eccentricity He's a slow child Don't you walk away from me You're an animal When I'm not pleading with my mind Please go
Okay, I am here with William J. Stokes from the band Voca Gentle. Um, thank you so much for that amazing set. Uh, that was really great. It was really fun having something so different on Noise Blast this time around. Um, really different from most of the things we've had in the past. So thank you so much for for welcome. that along. Thanks for having us. So I'm going to deviate from our normal first question. We'll get to the to a bit about the songs themselves. Um, but first, tell us a little bit about Voca Gentle. Um, who are you? What's your musical philo musical philosophy? And uh, tell us a bit about how you came to form a band. So we came to form a band um, when our previous bands met on a tour. My band was touring. Um, and Image and Eddie's previous band was booked to support us at a show in um, Edinburgh in Scotland. And at the time we were both in, um, our background is actually more in folk music um, and sort of harmony singing. Image and Ellie particularly grew up on um, a lot of, yeah, Americana, James Taylor and uh, the Indigo Girls and, and also actually a lot of sort of um, more traditional British folk as well, like Fairport Convention. Um, I, on the other hand, grew up um, more on a diet of sort of fusion jazz and, um, you know, a bit of Paul Simon thrown in as well. So anyway, we um, basically, yeah, we were kind of in, in sort of separate, more Americana driven bands. Um, and when we played together, we sort of, I suppose we had a lot of mutual respect for one another and kept in touch and then, as those two projects sort of wound down, um, we realized that we we had a real appetite to work together as a three. And um, at the same time, our musical diets and our tastes were expanding quite a bit, I suppose, in the sense that we, yes, I guess our, our just our listening habits, um, we, I was I particularly started to get much more influenced by bands like Animal Collective um, mm. and uh, just who I kind of still consider a folk band, actually, I want to say for the record. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and basically we, that was when we decided to buy a Moog Little Fatty and then it was all downhill from there, basically. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I can definitely hear that folk influence in their vocals. I it's one of the things that struck me uh, the very first thing when I, I first listened to one of your songs. It was the, I heard that and it's just really beautiful. I love their voices together. But it's um, something that we've always maintained. We've never tried to kind of graduate from that. It's always been it's actually always been really in the middle of everything. Um, you know, we we we're an equal parts band. We're kind of, you know we don't have a lead singer. We don't have a the lead songwriter and certainly yeah like you can see a lot of that across folk music actually you know Crosby Stills and Nash and um yeah Indigo Girls and and all sorts of different collaborative projects that you know that that you know I remember Sarah Jarose and um oh my gosh um uh, the name escapes me I'm with her the name of the band was Aoife, Aoife Donovan, Sarah Jarose and um Oh, the name the name of the last girl escapes me but anyway just like lots of lots of you know really powerful groups coming together as a group and not sort of a band backing up one person and then we and that's kind of always stayed as like a central tenet of of how we perform live and how we write songs and 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 we've grown as producers individually and our knowledge of sound design and and um all the things that surround conventional songwriting uh, together so that actually leads me to a question I was going to ask a little bit later but uh, all three of you are singers songwriters producers so what what how how do you write a song when all three of you have equal parts to contribute like take us a little bit through the songwriting process with uh, equal part contributors three equal part contributors well to be honest, the songwriting, when it comes to individual songs, isn't, it's actually not always equal parts. You know, an album will certainly be equal parts. And once somebody brings something to the rest of the band, it will be in the public domain. 
and will take equal ownership of it. But ordinarily, if somebody has like a, an impetus, an idea that suddenly want to to write, you know, it's the best thing you can do with that is actually allow them to to have executive control over their idea until they're ready to say, okay, you know. And and the great thing about having a band with three songwriters is that you can you can abandon an idea on a personal level at quite an early stage and just open it up to everybody else, you know. Um, but when somebody, you know, no, ordinarily, if you're really working with it and you're vibing or something, you don't wanna you don't wanna open it up too early, you know. And often we'll sometimes, I mean, when we meet together with writing, it's quite funny because sometimes you know someone will have a song and they'll it'll have got to quite a developed stage of the demo phase, and someone will have already they'll have already tracked the the lyrics or maybe like a you know um you know mum, mumbling lyrics but they'll, they'll have like a lot of elements in there and they'll go you know what do you think of this and then there'll be another idea will be like oh this is just something that i and then someone else might go oh no that's really great actually can we can we look at that together and there have been like there are definitely more and more actually i think maybe that's just because we've got more confident in um in just trying stuff i think it's certainly in the earlier stages of the band There was just like more of an insecurity, you know, where you'd have an idea that was in a really fetal stage and you'd say, oh, no, it's just it's not, you know, this is not good headphones, that kind of thing. <laughs> does that answer the question? <laughs> it does. And I, I love like the, just the description of the increasing levels of trust and, you know, understanding um, even just as a as a band, understanding the vibe that you're going for, it sounds like, and just like how that's grown over time. That's really cool. Um, so let's talk about the the set. Uh, you played for a uh, slow Joe and respect my eccentricity. Um, tough word to say. Uh, <laughs> tough word to, to sing. sing. That's why we don't sing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, both of these are on the upcoming writhing, which I mentioned will be out on the twenty second of October. Uh, so uh, tell us a bit about these songs. Those two songs sort of came from um yes yeah, so they sort of they came from a similar stage in the writing process of the album actually um you know they're they're both they're both composed in quite similar ways they're both repeated just contemplations on more or less on one uh sequence one chord sequence mm -hmm. um I guess in, yeah, in slow Joe it's a different chorus, but it's more it's essentially yeah, it's just over and over and over again the same chord sequence, and um, I think that's that's representative of something definitely that this album, compared to our first album, is much there's much more of that um, contemplation, that contemplative uh, aspect of, um, where you're just exploring an idea, um, sort of very freely and across a plane as opposed to trying to move from from a to b in a very directive way um we had lots of like section changes um in uh, on our first album which which you know we're really really uh pleased with and that totally represented where we were at that time um but in, a, in the same way this represents more where we're at now which is that yeah we like to we like to take a kind of an explorative approach of something that is in the first instance, actually very accessible. So Respect My Eccentricity started off with that guitar hook in the writing process that was, it was actually very fast and aggressive, a kind of the ins a big inspiration for that song was the, was the track um, Date With Ikea by Pavement. And it kind of had that real like, and then, and then instead of using the pick and then sort of slow it down, just use the pad of the thumb and then realize it was much groovier and much more vulnerable. And it, similarly in the recording process, um, right up until the last minute you know we um decided to instead of backing off the microphone we actually came you know i came um much closer with the lead vocal and sang really really quietly um so there's kind of a vulnerability and a tenderness and yeah those two songs actually well slow joe it's interesting the tenderness kind of develops into something much more aggressive actually so which is yeah, yeah. um but that's kind of got quite acid house at the end there. 
<laughs> and I can listen back to it. it was, it was, all we needed was a was a was it three hundred three filter. Bow 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 bow. Um, <laughs> Um, I know since um, this is the noise bus, a lot of people are going to want to know a bit more about the modular stuff too. What else did you have going in the Euro rack rack? Uh, so for that session, um, what have I got? So, so a big, a sort of a central, a central module um, in my system is the mutable instru instruments rings. Um, a big part of my, I always think that some, like a modular system says a lot about your philosophy of synthesis in general, um, what you choose to have. And for me, I think that my philosophy is based around making electronic sounds sound like acoustic sounds and acoustic sounds sound like electronic sounds. That's not to say that you're trying to imitate, like if you were like a drum synthesizer, you're trying to imitate real drums, but you're trying to give start sounds like a, a solidity and a, a feeling that they could be moving through the air and not just down a wire kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I really like, um, I've, got a, I've got a few physical modeling um, bits and pieces. I've got the, the, the little 2HP pluck, which is um, which is this um, bit, got a similar algorithm to some of the settings on the rings. Um, yeah, the morphogene, which I absolutely love. And um, norm, it's a great. That's also a great creative catalyst. If I'm if I'm you know loading any kind of sample I've taken or a field recording into it, and even so, I actually loaded in um, recently a a whole radio jingle that. Um, Imogen and Ellie's mum sang on in the 70s. I put this, she was a singer in a, in like the house group in this Christian radio station in the 70s. And so they've got these really, they've got a whole compilation of these really cheesy, we actually open, our first album opens with one of them. Oh, wow. And we, um, anyway, I imported one of them into the morphogene and did this kind of reversing and chopped it up and everything and, and, and suddenly there was this moment where there was an entirely different song playing with like these weird backwards sounding vocals and it was a completely different song. So I sampled that and then that's kind of become, well, it might not be anything. <laughs> um, but yeah, the Morphogene is great. It's really good. Um, uh, the No Coast as well, for, also from Nate, Make Noise. Um, that was actually kind of the, the, the thing that started off my my whole system actually was was that synth. It's a great kind of, it's in like a mini Euro rack system in one really. It's got little small versions of everything. Um, the noise engineering BIA is, the Bazimilis Ceteritis Altair is just one of my favorite modules of all time. I think it's absolutely amazing. Thank you. Um, you can hear it all the way through that session. <laughs> um, yeah, just really punchy, really, it you know, I love how I can bring the same approach to sound sculpting with that as I would to any other um, any other synthesizer that I have, um, which which makes it really good for somebody like me who I don't feel like I know loads about drum machines. I don't feel like I know even that much about drum synthesis, but it bridges a gap somehow. Um, that yeah, that I I am um, it just really works with my workflow. And then I've got. Uh, what else have I got? A couple of um, the new Expert Sleepers analog modules, Beatrix and Ivo and Lorelei, uh, which are a phaser and a oscillator and a filter. Really, really, really nice. And then for my transport, I've got um, an ALM Pamela's new workout, which is like my master clock for everything. Um, and their recent firmware updates have just been amazing with they've added like quantizing to some of their waves and uh, well, to all of their waves, <laughs> they've, added, they've added quantizing. Um, and um, yeah, it's just, that's a, that's a real, that's a real gem of a module. Um, as, as you know, loads of people will say. Um, I've also recently got, I've got the new um, ALM Jumble Henge, which is their mixer. It's like a stereo, it's like a grid, grid of inputs basically. And you just play, you just patch in wherever you want something to be panned. And then it also has like a filtering where it, it expand, it, it puts a low cut on the stuff that's at the top and a, and a, um, 
and a high cut on the stuff that's at the bottom and then you can really like space everything out so everything was going through that um and then um the um endorphins ground control was my main sequencer um for that one i also have a, oh and the dope for dark time um i also have the um intelligel metropolix but i wasn't using that in that set oh i have also got a really cool one um no i, I was going to get it out but i can't because it's <laughs> screwed in <laughs> um it's by an italian company called clatters and it's called a garden listener and it's um it comes with these two probes that you attach to the leaves of a plant <laughs> and then it takes the electrical impulses from the leaves of the plant and turns it into cv and midi but I realized that possibly cooler than using a plant was like, it responds differently to different parts of your body. So when you, when you put it on your head, it like kind of, it's just kind of, it sounds almost random, but it's slightly less random than truly random. But then I you know, put these two probe things on your head and then you put them on your heart and it goes berserk because it's like closer <laughs> to all these electrical impulses. It's amazing. Um, so maybe that's for another session. <laughs> <laughs> So I noticed that Voca Gentle tends to gravitate toward collaborations, like Writhing is just full of collaborations. Uh, and it's really great to see, especially in this extremely isolated time. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, how do you find the collaborations? And like, what, how, what do you seek out? Do you start a song thinking, oh, this song would be great to collaborate with X person, or do you find somebody you really want to work with and then write a song around that? Uh, how does, how do you work with collaborations? Well, the first thing to say is that collaborations, I suppose, don't really feel any different to the way that we work normally because everything is so equal powered. So everything is a collaboration really in the band. Um, That's such a sort good of, answer. <laughs> um, I suppose I'm just thinking of the, yeah, we, we rarely, we rarely look to collaborate before we know why. And I think that, that most people that we would approach, whether they're friends or people we don't know so well would respond or do respond better when you have an actual reason why you want to work with them. Mm -hmm. And I, and inversely or conversely, I, no, not conversely, inversely. I don't really like it when people come to me and they say they want to work with me on a production level and they say things like, we just thought you could bring like some, some sort of weirdness. And then it's kind of like, well, what is it that you want me to do? Because, <laughs> you know. When you're songwriting, you, you know, we met because you're a modular person and we got in touch about one of your modules. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about how you use modular in songwriting where do you use it like what what part of the songwriting journey is leads you to the to your modular synth and and where and when do you think you need to incorporate that in the songwriting so with modular if it's at the early stage of a songwriting process or a composition process it feels like it's so reactive against itself you know you make a patch and you just you can immediately like my, my dad is a painter and a and a visual artist and uh, he works a lot with collage as well and he um he he said something recently to me that was recently that was quite a surprise which is that he he never he never starts a painting knowing what it's going to be it's abstract painting he never starts a, a painting sort of knowing what it's going to be exactly what it's going to be he like often he'll have like series of things that follow like compositional patterns or um but often he says that it's it's totally reactive where he'll he'll make a mark and the question will be okay am i going to develop that mark or am i going to push against it or am i going to interrupt it or am i going to and it, and it's very, and it, it really chimes with me about modular because it really feels like it's very difficult to, unless your brain is like crazy wired in that exact way, it's very difficult to sit down in a modular system and go, I'm going to make this sound. And then you patch it in, um, you know, and it, and it turns out exactly as you expected it to be. Um, and I think that that is what's so great about it is that you, maybe you have an abstract idea. So I want to, I want to create something, you know, abrasive or industrial I want to create something that's 
that's paddy and washy or something that's really um you know deep sounding or something that's very melodic and you know you're working immediately in these abstracts and it totally circumvents a lot of the things that can that can be a challenge in conventional composition um and i mean similarly if i was like <laughs> if i was like man i've got these like these lyrics you know i would not sit down at a modular synth to try and develop that idea <laughs> yeah. um but it's um yeah it's kind of it it taps into a totally different part of the brain and i think that that's something that i really love about i mean its whole history is that isn't it it's like you know you know so sort of don buchler wanted to open up music to people that didn't even consider themselves that musical by by giving this completely different interface completely different way of working and you know and and i think that that probably thousands and thousands of people through synthesis over the decades have realized that they can actually make great music even though they never really consider themselves conventionally very musical um so that's in terms of like composing from a from scratch that's kind of that's sort of one of its biggest strengths for me having it in my studio is being able to to to, to sort of just to yeah just to kind of create just to throw some paint on a on a canvas and just push off it and see where that goes the other side of that is that when that's kind of like a there's a developed idea that i'm tapping into uh, or or that, I, that you know that that it, that exists and it's something that i want to develop or in the band we're kind of we're at a stage in the demo process where we feel like we want to, we want to, um, you know, it's got to that point where we want to kind of, we want to pair a sort of a composition with, with, a, with a piece of sound design to bring out a certain character and what it, what it is we're doing or, or sometimes allow that to change the character of the song completely. I love seeing how, um, you know, sometimes you can really fly in the face of what, a song is doing um, with with a piece of modular sound design, um, or you can really aid it, you know. Um, but but I find that often it can it can make me think about a, a song in a, in a completely different way, and it can actually yeah bring out real differences in 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 so, in a piece of songwriting. I suppose I'm just trying to think of a good example of that. As a band, I I know you tend to gravitate toward field recordings, and you've said uh, I'm going to use this quote from your press um, your press pack that the first album had pastoral recordings of birds and grass and waves. This record is about a concern for the natural world, things that are in danger or things that are causing that danger. There are recordings of bees, of ice cracking, of traffic. Um, I'll note that there was a really nice use of an Oxford comma there. We are an Oxford comma company. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's an album about this moment, about feeling out of control. I wanted to ask you why why field recordings in general, and why why these specific field recordings to tell this story. I think that field recordings are kind of the closest thing you can get in music to a sort of a watercolor painting or a sketch um they're very they 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 just they you know sort of take you it's almost literally take you to a place um that is outside of the studio and it's outside of a kind of a you know a sort of a, the kind of like i said earlier like it's a, it's outside of sounds moving as voltages through wires and it sounds moving through the air or it sounds even moving through water or um across an, you know, a natural or an industrial physical landscape and sound has different characteristics. And usually when you're recording, I find that where you choose to take field recordings has a big impact on, um, uh, on, its, on its application. Um, it's, you, you would, the purpose behind taking a field recording is different in a natural environment to how it is in an industrial environment because often we're in an urban environment because because often sounds recorded in an urban environment are about kind of 
trying to rethink very familiar sounds. Whereas sounds taken off in, in a natural environment, it's more explorative and it's more about, it's almost more about the unfamiliar in some ways, sometimes, not always. But I think that it's, that it's definitely, you know, we, we wanted to establish in the first album a real sense of place that wasn't necessarily where the listener was as they were listening to it. Um, which in that case was on the west coast of Wales. Um, and on this album, well, I suppose there is that sense of place as well, but it's more, it's more about showing something kind of going wrong really, or something that maybe isn't to do with geography, isn't to do with trying to set a scene so much as trying to use sound trying to use that watercolor or that sketch to kind of just quickly express something about, you know, that recording, why it is that you've chosen to, to press record. So um, if that, I don't know if that makes any sense, hopefully it does. Like, so we've got, yeah, ice cracking and we've got, um, there's um, sounds of, you know, of central London that we use this, I think I mentioned it earlier briefly, but we used this um, a device designed by a really talented guy called Benton Ching, um, who came with us for this expedition. With it was um, it's about this big, and it's called a miasma field modulator, and it has air intakes and microphones, um, and it also latches onto the um, like the data for pollution levels in a certain area, uh, the database, and essentially you you load a sound into it, and it and as the air quality gets worse, it interrupts the sound with these kind of flickering, um, kind of like chirping sounds um, where we, yeah, that was an example of using um, a piece of sound design to actually in, impinge on a, what would otherwise be quite a pleasant experience um, and using you know, pollution levels as a big environmental kind of focus in this record. Um, and, and yeah, kind of, I suppose that's kind of got like a double layer to that one because it's, it's actually also about what we're doing to the field recording that is kind of the significance maybe, um, or at least on a philosophical level, but there are other things like there's bees, we recorded bees as well. Um, really that was, <laughs> that was quite scary though, <laughs> to really stick, stick your hand in the middle of the, the bush full of bees, but it was, that was kind of more of a um, a reference to, to how important bees are in 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 our ecosystem. Um, there's a mural in East London, which has in an area called Bethnal Green, it has a big, big picture of bees, and it just says, um, "When we go, we're taking you all with us." And that's wow. that was the name of that little piece. But um, that was kind of about uncomfortability as well. It's kind of they're important, but it was also kind of it's not a nice experience to be surrounded by the buzzing of bees. But again, actually thinking about it, we interrupt that sound. There's a we bring in this modulating delay, which kind of creates the it starts to self oscillate, and then the bees kind of fade out, and you're just left with this one self oscillating tone. Um, there's a lot of um, yeah nature versus uh, other <laughs> humans. <laughs> um, and I think that that was a big focus of this. Yeah. I'm trying to think off the top of my head where there were other, where there were other field recordings. There are loads on the, on the album, but they've all gone out of my head. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I, think the yeah. field, I think that it's kind of the equivalent of, yeah. It's a bit like, you know, you take that sketch and you maybe you stick a train ticket on it or something, or you stick a, you stick some sort of memento of where you were onto it, or you tear the piece of paper, or you kind of, you make it about an interaction between two things, I suppose as well as just noting it down, which is kind of what we did in the first album. God, maybe that sounds really wanky. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking how lovely that was. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was a really great description, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's good, that's good. <laughs> well, 
William J. Stokes, thank you so much. This has been a complete pleasure talking to you about Voca Gentle, the new album Writhing, which will be out on October 22nd. Get it um, anywhere that people find music. Uh, we'll uh, put a link in uh, the description to your band's webpage. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, for um, having, for recording the set for us and for chatting with us today. You're welcome. Thanks so much for having me and us. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Well, that does it for this sporadic installment of the Noise Last Hour, sponsored by Noise Engineering, featuring Boca Gentle. Uh, we hope you enjoyed what you heard, and the interview was as much fun for you as it was for me to do. Uh, and you'll join us next time, whenever that might be. And be sure to like and subscribe so that you don't miss it. Uh, and Again, links to all of the important things are below in the description. Check it out. Um, and their first album from Vocal Gentle, Start Clanging the Symbols, is available now on Spotify, um, Apple Music, all the places you would normally listen, um, as well as several of the singles, including the two you heard today from the new album, um, Necrofauna, the one featuring Wayne Coyne from The Flaming Lips, um, and the one that dropped just the other day on Thursday TV Raw are all available now. Uh, and their second full-length album, Writhing, drops October 22nd, so be sure to check that out. That does it for me. I thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.